Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, there were so many good talks in this time slot. It's really exciting to see so many, so many people attending mine. This is, this is wonderful. Um, so uh, as Valerie mentioned, my name is Jamie, uh, Jamie Gaskins. Um, I'm from Baltimore. And uh, uh, so let's go ahead and jump right into it. I'm not sure, every time I've done this, uh, rehearsed this talk, it's gone different amounts of time. So we'll see what happens. Uh, so first, uh, I'll stop hitting the spacebar that hard, but um, when we talk about optimization, we need, we need to kind of like understand what, like what that means. Like we need to turn this fuzzy term into something that's a bit more concrete that, that we can, uh, that will allow us to communicate about it better. And so at a, at a high level, uh, optimization is about uh, improving a, some metric that, that you've chosen. You've chosen a metric to improve, and you want to move it in some desired direction along some particular axis, right? And so to improve a metric, we make changes to our system and then measure the effects. Uh, in this example, we're optimizing RAM consumption. So we want to, uh, we want to move that metric towards zero. We want to take our, our amount of memory that we're consuming in production and reduce it. So the, the actual des desired direction uh, that I mentioned before is towards zero. Uh, because the less memory that we use in our application, the more we have on tap for spikes in capacity, uh, spikes in volume. So this is just like, yay, we're just reducing memory, right? This seems so easy, right? Mission accomplished. Uh, but it's like, is it? Is it, like, are we really done? What other metrics did we look at? Did any of them get worse as we improved this one? Because especially as, as systems grow in complexity, optimizations might have consequences that are not easy to see and definitely not easy to anticipate. So let's say, for example, that memory consumption was high because we were using in-memory caching instead of a hot code path. So now in, uh, we're recalculating the same handful of values um, uh, on each pass through that code. And as a result, instead of our Ruby processes each using a fraction of a CPU core, they're actually, each one is potentially using the entire core for itself. So some of the things that we're gonna go over today are, like what are metrics? Like what metrics do we need to think about? How do we communicate about performance? And what are some of these trade-offs that, that, uh, that we may, be, may be introducing to our, uh, into our code base? So first, some of our, our metrics uh, that we need to think about are, um, you may want to optimize RAM consumption for, for when your production machines are starting to approach 100% uh, RAM usage. Uh, app boot time can be problematic if rebooting your production app causes significant delays in processing. Milliseconds per transaction can be important if, uh, if, you, if customers have to wait uh, for that transaction to finish before they can proceed. And when I say transactions, I don't necessarily mean a monetary transaction or a database transaction. It's just a generic term for a unit of work. So this can be uh, this could be a web request, um, uh, a background job, uh, me processing a message that came in over over your your message queue, anything like that. Um, and transactions per second is an important metric for being able to handle uh, for being able to track how much uh, how much you can process at scale. Um, we also have some other metrics that we, that we're not that we're not uh, thinking about necessarily uh, consciously, but you know they're, they're in our minds somehow, and so but we, they are things that we need to think about. Uh, and some of these are things like time uh, from feature inception to release is uh, is, a, is a good measurement for initial deployment of, of any of a feature or a service. Um, you might call it a greenfield metric, like once you begin working on a new feature, how long does it take before customers see it? Not necessarily until it's done completely, but before before somebody has it in hand. Um, do you do you count the amount of time it's at in the back backlog, uh, in, 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 inside your task tracking backlog? Why would you or why would you not? These are things. These are just things to to keep in mind. Uh, time between deploys can be useful to see how granular improvements to an app are, are over time. Do we need to make a lot of changes to existing code? Uh, so just you know, before we can deploy this new feature, um, uh, or or can or can we just can we just add stuff add new stuff in? Time from bug discovery to deployment of the bug fix can be useful in understanding the team's firefighting capabilities um, and ability to, abilities to respond to errors that crop up in, in production. 
Is it becoming more difficult to fix bugs that we're introducing? That's a, that's a metric that we can use. And again, these aren't necessarily things we should be optimizing for, but we might be, it, it might be things we're optimizing for subconsciously, it just, we just need to know that we're doing it. And so our next step here is talking about communicating about performance. Because most of the time when we talk about optimization, we just throw that word around. Just like optimization, two people that are discussing the word performance might be actually talking about different things. So let's break that down a bit. When we talk about performance, we're usually talking about how fast it executes. So we need, you know, when you talk about any, the speed of anything, you're, you're talking about time. And so the discussion of, of performance typically revolves around one of these concepts. How long it takes to, run, to do something once, and how long it takes to, uh, how many times you can do that thing in any given time period. And it turns out these can be very different metrics. Uh, it's tempting to think of them as, as being inversely proportional to each other, and in a lot of simple cases, this very well can be. Because in a lot of, especially in a lot of cases where, uh, that are easily dem demoable, like something that you could, you could do, hack out in like a, a few minutes, uh, they, they almost always are inversely proportional. Uh, but in complex systems, there can be a lot of other factors. If you can, for example, if you can parallelize the process, uh, the cost of doing it 10 times might be the same as doing it once, the, the time cost, that is, uh, could, might be the same as doing it once, assuming you haven't reached some sort of CPU or I.O. limit. If you can cache the result, the cost of doing it 10 times might be anywhere from 1 to 10 times, depending on, uh, 1 to 10x, depending on uh, the number of unique inputs to your, to your, uh, uh, your caching function, uh, how you, how you, how you, def you uh, derive your cache key. Um, for a deep dive on, on how uh, caching can, can help or, or harm your app, uh, definitely want to check out Molly Struby's talk right in this exact same spot just after the break. Uh, if your service runs on JRuby or some other uh, Ruby implementation that contains, a, that contains a, uh, what they call a JIT, a just-in-time uh, compiler, uh, the nth iteration of, of your code might actually be running in a fraction of the time uh, than, than, it, than the first iteration because the first, on the first iteration, the JIT and the code optimizer were, were cold. They hadn't, they hadn't actually been run on your code yet. Um, on later runs, this is, not, this is not, probably not the case, and they may have done some, done some JIT compiling and dead code removal, method inlining, things like that, to, to your code as it runs. Um, great tools, but they, uh, they, they do mean that your code will likely run slower the first time, and that's just something that you need to be aware of, especially while optimizing. And those are a few ways that it can be faster than proportional, uh, but it could also go the other, the other direction. For example, if, you, uh, if the first iteration doesn't end up invoking the garbage collector, uh, but subsequent runs do, then you can, you can end up taking longer on subsequent, uh, subsequent iterations of that, of that code. And that's just like when, we talk, start, when we're talking about CPU time. Once we start adding I.O. to the mix, uh, we open up a whole new world of variability in optimizing for one or the other, because then it becomes even more nebulous. And this, to me, is when things actually get really interesting. This is when it starts getting into that, that complicated uh, sec segment. Um, uh, so requests made to remote APIs are subject to the performance of not only the systems that they're talking to, which have their own performance curves to think about, uh, but also the network that you're communicating on. If you're, if you're not maintaining persistent connections to these, uh, those API servers, you may also be subject to things like t you know, uh, secondary TCP handshakes, TLS negotiation, and TCP slow start. Other things that slow down your communication. Um, if you're talking to a remote cache, uh, this adds processing time to the initial execution time as we wait for our cache key to be acknowledged by the cache server. Uh, so it has a lot of the same considerations of the API because a, uh, a remote cache is technically an API, uh, but subsequent interactions with the cache can be improved. Talking to the file system can also be slow, especially if we're running on cloud infrastructure where the disk might not actually be on the same machine that your application is running on. We typically think of disk access being, uh, being uh, instant because the, the latency between your, uh, your application and, and the disk when it's on the same machine is measured in a few microseconds, whereas uh, it might actually be one to three orders of magnitude longer in, on cloud infrastructure. Uh, if your application uses a database of any sort, you may need to take into account the performance characteristics of that database. 
Some databases optimize for read over write performance. Um, you might have indexes that you need to, to take into account and how those impact both read and write performance. But how do we distinguish between two concepts, uh, these two concepts here, um, when we use such a loaded term like performance all the time? Saying it's faster if we do it this way doesn't actually communicate what you mean. The half of the people that you're talking to will probably choose one, one definition of, of one of these two definitions, like how long it takes to run once, and one will choose the other, uh, which is ha like how many times it can run in a given time period. So when we discuss how long it takes to do something once, we can use the word latency instead, instead of performance. And when we discuss how many times you can do something in a given time period, we can call that throughput. And this gives us some vocabulary to kind of be, you know, be more concrete about this nebulous term of performance. And which one of these matters to you uh, is based entirely on your needs at any given time. There are a lot of factors that you could, that you could, uh, that could make you choose one or the other. If you're concerned about, for example, uh, the volume of data that you have to process uh, versus your capacity to process it, then, then you, might, be, you want, might want to focus on throughput and optimize for, for throughput. If your customers have to sit there while something happens, latency might be the thing that you want to focus on. Uh, and even then, there can be diminishing returns on that. It, for example, if you take, uh, if it takes two to 10 milliseconds of, ad of additional latency to offload a, uh, some particular operation to some other machine, that, mean, that might mean that you take 60 milliseconds instead of 50. But and if you're looking at raw numbers, like that's a 20% increase in latency. That, that's gonna seem slow. But if you're freeing up 50 milliseconds of processing time on that machine, then, then you're, it's, it's actually a throughput gain, despite being a latency loss. And, so, and nobody besides a professional StarCraft player is gonna notice that extra 10 milliseconds of latency. So 50 milliseconds uh, 50, that, oh, also, that 50 milliseconds of CPU time uh, might, seem like, might not seem like a lot, but when you're doing it on the scale of millions of those jobs, that's when it starts to add up. And this is actually the, kind, of, kind of the basis of distributed computing, where you start delegating tasks off to other machines. And notice I mentioned at any given time. This means that once you've chosen a primary metric that, that you're concerned about, it's not set in stone. You can't really optimize for one thing at the expense of all else forever. Uh, it's, a lot of times it comes down to a matter of scale. And if, par if, part, of, if part of your system that, rece that receives the most traffic, like for, in, in a, lot of, uh, a lot of applications, this is things like uh, a lot of like, large systems, this might be your user identity or authentication service, whatever you call it. Uh, if that has enough capacity to handle even your largest volume spikes, uh, then you likely want to prioritize latency over throughput because adding adding throughput capacity doesn't actually, doesn't actually net you any benefit. When that's no longer true, because your marketing department has just started crushing it recently, uh, then you may need to start optimizing throughput. And so that's our, that's our com communicating, communicating about performance. The fact that I stumbled through that is hilarious because I'm talking about communication. Um, but that's, uh, um, so, there are a lot of different ways that we, can, that we can understand communicating about performance, and a lot of that is about removing ambiguity. Because ambiguity, like if you want to optimize your communication, then, uh, then removing ambiguity is one of the biggest, one of the biggest uh, factors in that. And so next, we're going to talk about trade-offs. And there are a lot of different trade-offs that you can make. You might, you might be trading CPU, uh, CPU consumption versus RAM consumption. Uh, you might optimize for small data sets or large data sets. Uh, you, might, uh, you might look at caching versus recalculation, like cash, caching a result versus, versus recalculating it. L latency versus throughput, like we talked about. Readability versus throughput. We're gonna, we're gonna go through that in a little, in a little bit. That's gonna be great. Uh, and performance under load versus performance at idle, because those can be very different. And so this, this CPU versus RAM thing is, uh, is a pretty huge deal in like data structures and algorithms uh, discussions. If your, app, if your application's performance depends heavily on a, few, on, on a few algorithms that are just used everywhere, then it might be worth looking into whether those, uh, whether those algorithms optimize for space or time efficiency, which is really just a fancy way of saying um, it optimizes for RAM or CPU. Uh, 
Uh, maybe you choose between, for example, uh, to, you know, one, one way that, that you might um, have to choose between those is maybe if you process a file line by line from disk, this, this can be slower depending on, depending on a lot of factors. Um, uh, if to process line by line versus read the whole thing in in one, one big blob and then split it, split it on lines. Um, another another uh, uh, possible you know, choice between, between these two are memory allocation within, within Ruby itself. Uh, so it, within MRI, Mass's Ruby interpreter, uh, memory allocation is done by asking the operating system for entire 16 kilobyte pages of memory. And um, with some exceptions, all of your Ruby objects live within one of these pages. Uh, MRI allocates and, uh, and garbage collects from, from, these, from these pages. Rather than calling the underlying system calls, uh, known as malloc and free for allocation and, and freeing up uh, memory. Um, because those are, those are slow. Those are slow to, ke to keep calling over and over. And so rather than, rather than doing it for each object, what Ruby actually does is it allocates a whole batch of RAM for you and then, you know, and then uh, works within, the, within that batch on its own because it can optimize that. It can't optimize those malloc and free calls. And, and that's a trade-off that they've made because like, even though it ends up using more memory and a lot of that memory ends up tending to be you know, pretty sparse a lot of the time. Uh, and and from, the, from when you're external to the process looking in, it might look like you're just using gobs of RAM, um, when really a lot of that a lot of that RAM is just reserved within within your Ruby interpreter. And so that's a trade-off that they've made. Uh, memoization is another is another big thing that usually this isn't uh, so much of a trade-off, but al almost more of a more of a technique to keep from having from having to recalculate every time. And it's it, memoization is just a, like a fancy term for caching at the object level. Uh, so rather than running the same computation, you actually, you run the computation once, store it in an instance variable, and next time you call that method, you just return the instance variable. And that's, that's, a, that's one technique that you can use. Uh, one of our next trade-offs that, that, we, that we're gonna go through is optimizing for small versus large data sets. And this is, a, this is something that we're all gonna get wrong a million times from now until we retire. Uh, so we might use something that scales well for large data sets, but if we're running it on a small data set, it might not perform well. Uh, or we might use, some, use something that's optimized for small data sets, but then it doesn't scale well when we have to run it in production against data sets that have you know, millions of elements in them. Uh, right. So, these, these three things are important to keep in mind when working with any, any amount of data in production. One is that most, most of your data sets, most of the time, are going to be small, but not all of them. And even some that are small most of the time may not be small all the time. And so we typically might have to do something, we might have to take a graph like this, where we're trying to choose between two algorithms based on how they perform at different, uh, at, at different sizes, with different uh, data set sizes. Say one of them, one of, the, one of these two algorithms performs really well with the small data set, and one of them performs really well with the large one. And there's a very clear intersection point uh, in there where, where, where they cross over. And so you have to kind of, you have to think about like, do I, need to, do I need to optimize for the small case or the large case? What do I use the most in production? Another question that might come up and should uh, come up in these discussions is why the one that performs poorly with small data set matters, uh, with small data sets matters. Um, and in, a, in some cases it doesn't matter. Uh, but if the large optimized one is used a lot with small data sets, then you can actually, uh, you can actually in, you know, impede your performance in production. So which do you end up, which, which do you end up choosing? Like which one do you want to use? Just use both. So, when we, when we look at this, at that intersection point, we, we can see where one outperforms the other. And we can, on data sets that are smaller, we can use, we can use the, one, the blue line. The ones that are larger, we can use the, the green line that scales better. Um, 
MRI does this internally in several places. For example, when a, when a hash has three, or three keys or fewer, three keys or fewer, it stores them inside of a flat array instead of storing them inside this complex data structure uh, that it uses internally for, for hash, uh, for, uh, what's the word? Key resolution. Um, to resolve a key into a value. It, with, with, with a sufficiently small, uh, small hash, it just iterates through until it finds the key. It doesn't, it doesn't actually use the, you know, the constant time lookup. But when it, when, uh, once you have more than three, three keys inside of a hash, it starts, it starts to use the more efficient hashing algorithm that, and, because iterating through a hash with 150 keys, not gonna be as efficient as iterating through a hash with one or two. Um, it also, like when you, when you call sort on an array, you might be running one of two different hashing algorithms for, uh, for that array based on the size, based on the array's size. Um, under some threshold, I don't actually remember the threshold, sorry, uh, it's, uh, it, it'll, it'll use a merge sort, whereas on a larger array, it'll choose to use a quick sort instead. Um, just because in, at least in the implementation that, that exists within MRI, like the, at those sizes, th those particular sorting algorithms typically work better. Big shout out to Vita Hijoshi for walking through the C code in MRI to help me figure that out. So, the first time you, uh, the, ne the next thing, I didn't even put a transition in there, all right, cool. Uh, so the, the next time you, uh, the first time you use caching, it might feel like uh, you found the answer to all of your performance problems. So caching versus recalculation is, a, is, is, another, is another big thing that we, we might wanna optimize for. And so, it can feel deceptively powerful when you're, when you're caching. Um, unfortunately, caching is not free. Um, there is a trade-off involved in, in caching. Uh, for example, we talked about in-memory caching earlier. The cost for that one is memory. If, you're, if you don't have the necessary RAM to spare, then in-memory caching maybe isn't the right, the, right, uh, the right move. And if you're using remote caching, this one's always fun. Uh, remote caching costs a little bit of time. And this is an odd statement because you're probably using caching to eliminate the time cost. Uh, but caching is more about mitigating, uh, in fact, all optimizations are about mitigating uh, costs than eliminating them. Um, but caching, caching especially. Uh, if your app's network latency to the remote cache is 10 milliseconds, and it takes milli 10 milliseconds to calculate that value, have you saved any time? Fun fact, maybe, maybe you did. Uh, it turns out that like, ping time to the cache server isn't the, on isn't the only factor uh, in, de in determining this. So, the cache server, while under load, might take several milliseconds to return a response, turning that 10 milliseconds into 20, for example, uh, when it would have only cost you 10 milliseconds to calculate from scratch. But it could, save, uh, it could save your application from spending 10 milliseconds of CPU time, different from wall clock time. I probably should have had a uh, distinction in there earlier in the slide deck for that. Uh, CPU time versus wall clock time. Uh, if, if, you're, if, you're, if you can push off CPU time to something else, um, like you can eliminate that CPU time cost, it might be worth the wall, the wall clock time cost uh, for throughput reasons. And it, so if CPU time is precious in your app, then that might be worth the additional network latency. And so when it, when it comes to caching, like we have the most cliche joke that we have uh, in, in software is that there are only two hard problems remaining in, uh, in, ca in computer science, cache and validation and naming things, and off by one errors. So if invalidating your, it, this, another fun fact about this is like, if invalidating your cache is about, is a, is a matter of determining your cache key, you're actually trying to, these are the same problem, cache and validation becomes naming things, because you have to name that, name that cache key. Uh, but, no one ever likes that joke. Ever, I, I've told it a million times. No one ever laughs. It's great. Uh, I think it's amazing. Uh, but I, I don't know. I, I always laugh more at my own jokes than anybody else does anyway. So, um, I like it. Hmm? I like that idea. Oh, thank you to the three people that liked my joke. So uh, adding caching can also add frustration uh, as you figure out how to invalidate your cache. Because uh, you don't want to return stale values from the cache. Uh, so you... Well, uh, Usually when you try to, try to 
try to avoid the stale values, you end up inv invalidating too frequently. Because your cache can't grow forever. You can't, conti you can't con just continue shoving data into that cache and expect it to keep, uh, expect it to keep uh, making your app fast. Um, so you have to figure out how you're gonna delete keys. Uh, and so there are a lot of different caching strategies that your cache server might support. Uh, the most common of these is called LRU, least recently used. Um, and, and it's the, it's, yeah, so it's the, it's the standard one that comes with, that you're, you're probably gonna use if you didn't configure a different caching strategy inside of your cache server. Um, and so the, lo the, the idea is behind that is like the longer it's been since you last, re last tried to fetch that key, then, then uh, the more likely it is to be, to be evicted from the cache. And yeah, so like there are several other ones that are really useful. One, another, another one that's very commonly useful is least frequently used. So uh, like when, when you start reaching, when you start reaching uh, capacity of your cache, um, that's when, uh, that's, that's when these ca cache invalidation strategies come, in, come into play. And so your cache hit rate is another, is another big factor. No matter how good your latency to the server is and how fast your cache responses are, uh, the first time you're making a request to the cache, you're paying both costs, both the request time to the cache server and the calculation time to calculate the value that you then shove into the cache. Um, so when you consider that you're doing this for every single cache key, it gets expensive unless, unless you're returning cached values more than some percentage of the time. Uh, with rare exceptions, you might want your cache hit rate uh, to be over 90%. Ideally, it would be over 99%. Um, if your cache rate's below 99%, you may want to, uh, you may want to see if you're invalidating too much. Uh, if your cache, rate, cache hit rate is below 90%, just, just pull it out. Get rid of the cache, because things like the, things like ca uh, stale cached values those are, those are a very big frustra uh, frustration, especially in development, because you actually don't know where those cached like you don't you, you may not realize you're hitting the cache, you may you may think that you're you're getting fresh fresh data, and so debugging debugging that stuff like that that has a cost, and so both both the cache hit rate and the uh, uh, what was the other one cache invalidation. Uh, those, both of those work together, um, just as, they're just as important together as they are apart. Uh, if you have a high hit rate, but, uh, but you're returning the wrong data, then your cache hit rate is pretty meaningless. If, uh, if you invalidate too eagerly, it'll reduce your cache hit rate and may cause you to, to uh, boost up the, the, your cache capacity um, unnecessarily. And so there's usually a lot of tuning involved when you, when you do use caching. So readability versus throughput is another, is another big trade-off that we make. Developer time is not free. In smaller companies, especially early stage startups, time, it, time that your developers spend on developing your product uh, might be your most expensive resource. Being able to read and understand that code, especially for, de for debugging purposes, will be, will be much more important, especially in the early days, than how fast it runs. On the flip side, if your app processes such a high volume, that a developer spending a week, a week of their, of their time, optimizing something, uh, and that gives your company enough of a performance boost that the company generates that developer's entire annual salary uh, and increased revenue, but the code is less re readable, that might be a worthwhile trade. Uh, for, for example, abstractions that Active Record provides are awesome, first of all, they're amazing. Uh, but it can also generate significant processing overhead, especially on complex join queries. Sometimes you may need to bypass Active Record, just remove it and drop into raw SQL. This, this can actually open, open the door to a different style of query, uh, like a common table expression, um, which I couldn't possibly think of how to explain in the slide, so I didn't, sorry. But they are a different type of query. Uh, uh, but if, if a join query wasn't the right move, but it was the only approach that Active Record provided. Then, uh, then maybe removing that abstraction can be um, can be can give you uh, some some sort of performance boost in that in that way. Abstractions do have do have a cost, and sometimes you may need to, while optimizing, you may need to remove the abstractions and start using uh, start using some of the underlying concepts directly. <laughs> 
Again, this is not a knock on Active Record. I, like it's it's really handy, and for for queries without joins, um, the performance overhead is kind of amazing. Uh, but just like every other piece of code ever written, especially you know especially by me, um, the there are situations where it can get in your way. And so when we look at performance under load versus performance at idle, you definitely want to, like if, when you're doing any sort of benchmarking um, or uh, performance, performance analysis, you may want to, like you definitely want to run it against the same workload that you're gonna have in production, that you're likely to have in production. Um, sometimes this means testing performance in production. Uh, so, because the, it might be amazing, the, the performance of a piece of code might be awesome when you're running it locally in development, but it, in production, it, like, you might have an entirely different performance profile. Um, so we might end up tuning performance based on uh, how it runs locally. But when we, when we push it up into production, like, all of a sudden it's not, it's not the same level of performance. Uh, uh, anecdotally, uh, at one company where I worked, a CPU, bound da a CPU bound task that ran in three seconds uh, in, in development took 20 minutes in production, simply due to the fact that I hadn't considered that it was not the only task running in production, and in fact it wasn't even the only instance of itself running. So you need to keep your production workload in mind when you're, when you're, when you're performing any sort of optimizations. And so that, uh, that runs through our, our big three concepts that we want, uh, overarching concepts that we wanted to talk about today. So, in summary, um, you're, you're, when you have a complex system, like, it's, like there are no simple explanations for, for performance in a complex system. Things you do in one, part of a, in one part of your system can affect things that happen in other parts of the system entirely, even if they don't seem related. Not all optimizations are created equal. There's no silver bullet to performance. The answer to every question when it comes, when it comes to production level performance is it depends. What else are we doing? There is, so yeah, so there's no one size fits all solution. Um, and for, for every optimization, there are scenarios where it doesn't actually make sense to, to perform certain optimizations. Latency and throughput are separate metrics, and it's important, it can be important not to conflate them. Uh, caching is somehow both the best optimization ever and also the worst optimization ever. Production workloads are vastly different from what we see in development, and we need to, we need to keep production workloads in mind. And for all optimizations that we, that we apply, we need to measure, tune, and then measure again. We want to record metrics in production for any optimizations that you want to apply. If at all possible, do them early, before you think you need them, so that you can have some, some kind of historical data to go on. You know, you'll probably just want to throw money at, like, at different metrics reporting uh, services like Labrato or New Relic. Get as much data about your app's performance as possible uh, before you start making any sort of decisions about optimization. On that note, that is, that is all I've got. Again, I'm Jamie Gaskins. Uh, feel, please feel free to talk to me uh, about any of the things that you, that you saw today, any other questions or comments that you've got. Um, and I think that's all I've got. Thank you so much, everybody.